most of us know Drosophila melanogaster, or the common fruit fly, as a household pest who turns up to remind us that we should be making more effort to eat healthily. But for the scientific community, the fruit fly is something of a superhero. This tiny fly has formed the basis of six Nobel Prizes, tens of thousands of scientific papers, and over a hundred years of research, which has transformed the way we think about biology and medicine. But why? Why do we use Drosophila? What have we learned, and how are they still relevant today? There are three main reasons that Drosophila have become so popular in research as what we call a model organism. The first is their short life cycle, which comes in four stages. Female Drosophila can lay around 100 eggs per day. These hatch into larvae. The larva turns into a pupa. Eventually, it transforms into an adult fly in a process known as metamorphosis. Drosophila can become grandparents in as little as 20 days. That's a lot of birthday notifications. The second reason is that they are small and cheap. Millions of flies can live in a single lab. They're happy being fed on cornmeal, sugar and yeast in agar jelly. This is even cheaper than the research student's diet of pizza, coffee and biscuits. Finally, and it may be difficult to believe, flies and humans share a lot in common. Yes, Drosophila have six legs, wings, a thorax, and some other things that you probably wouldn't want to wake up with. But they also have a surprisingly complex nervous system, a digestive tract, a circulatory system, and some of the most advanced vision found in insects. Perhaps most importantly, 75% of genes linked to disease in humans have an equivalent in Drosophila. Drosophila research has fewer ethical restrictions than experimenting on humans and mammals. Along with the practical matters like cost and lifespan, this makes them good models for studying the biology of human disease and development. One of the first and most famous scientists to work with Drosophila was Thomas Hunt Morgan, who introduced them to his lab at Columbia University in 1906. Like any good scientist, Morgan had lots of questions. How are physical features inherited? Where are these characteristics stored in the body? How do these features develop as something grows? He chose Drosophila because they grow quickly and they're cheap. At the time, chromosomes were known to exist, but nobody knew that they carried genetic material. After a year in the fly room, Armed with little more than a stock of flies, some rotten bananas and a magnifying glass, Morgan observed a lone fly with white eyes as opposed to the usual red. He bred the mutant with other normal flies. Morgan and his students observed that the resulting eye colour appeared to be related to whether the fly was male or female, as well as who its parents were. We call this sex-linked inheritance meaning genes are stored on the X or Y chromosome rather than any of the others. This explains why you're much more likely to meet a colourblind man than a colourblind woman. Shortly after, Morgan's students began grouping mutations that appeared to be related. Four groups of mutations were mapped that matched with the four chromosomes of Drosophila. Morgan and his students had finally solved the mystery of where genes were stored in the body. The era of genetics began. In the next 100 years, Morgan's successors at Columbia and Caltech went on to discover genes related to brain function. They also studied how a fully fledged fly develops from the bundle of cells that make up the embryo. Many of the discovered genes were found to be conserved in humans and so opened up huge advances in diverse areas of medicine and biology. Colleagues also used Drosophila to investigate the lasting effects of radiation damage, where damaged genes get passed to future generations. In spite of these discoveries, nuclear fission was harnessed for producing weapons just 18 years later, with devastating consequences. Another legacy of Morgan's work was his quirky convention for naming genes. This is still held today if the gene is discovered in Drosophila first. He named the gene after the physical characteristic, or phenotype, that it produced. 
To date, this has resulted in Groucho, Cheap Date, Hedgehog, Fuzzy Onions, Tudor, Swiss Cheese, Bagpipe, and Thor, along with many others. Relatives of many of these genes have since been discovered in humans. What started as a funny joke now sometimes produces awkward conversations at the doctor's office. The ultimate goal of these scientists who laid the foundations of genetics was to map the fly genome. We fully sequenced it 18 years ago, shortly followed by the human genome. You could forgive people for thinking that the era of the fly was over, but this full genetic profile and the fruit fly's other useful features means that it still plays a huge role today. Drosophila are used to study everything from cell behaviour and cancer treatment to jet lag and ageing. They've even been sent into space. Researchers at NASA wanted to understand whether living in low or zero gravity conditions would affect the fly's ability to combat disease. The astronaut flies had weaker immune systems than their Earth-based family Achoo. members. This has interesting implications for sending humans on long-term space flights. Meanwhile, back on Earth, fruit flies have been used to look at addiction and behaviour. One study found that if given the chance, Drosophila will drink alcohol to make themselves feel better. Rejected male fruit flies were four times more likely to drink than ones which found a mate. Testing drugs in flies allows the side effects in other parts of the body to be studied. This isn't something that can be done with cells grown in a dish. As a result, safer chemical compounds can be chosen for use in clinical trials. One example of this is Huntington's disease. Researchers inserted a human gene into Drosophila that is linked to the disease. This let them look for drugs which might treat the symptoms without causing other problems. ADHD has also been studied using fruit flies. ADHD is associated with hyperactivity and impaired learning, things you wouldn't think you could measure in a fly. Researchers weren't sure if the hyperactivity was causing the learning problems or if it was the other way around. They found that in flies, each behaviour comes from a different part of the brain but uses the same receptor. This kind of research has changed the way we think about ADHD, its symptoms and its treatment. As well as hyperactivity and learning ability, Drosophila also shows signs of age-related mobility and memory loss. This makes them ideal candidates for studying the mechanisms of Alzheimer's disease and potential treatments. Now, of course, things like personality loss in brain diseases can't really be measured in flies. The difficulty of translating fly observations to human behaviour is one of the disadvantages of using model organisms. We've got to the stage where we have some alternatives to animals. Examples include computer models of the body and organoids, simplified mini-organs grown in a lab from stem cells. In the future, we may become less reliant on model organisms such as Drosophila, zebrafish and mice. Whatever happens, there is no doubt that the flyer has earned its place in the history of science.